Hey, hey, everybody. Today is Saturday, June 28th, 2008, and you're listening to episode number 63 of On Tap, the official audio show of, wait for it, ontappodcast.com. That's right, our new website is up, once again, ontappodcast.com. And Chris and I, we, it's just Chris here today, by the way. Yes, hi. Say hey, yeah, there you go. Hey, yeah, there you go. <laughs> but yeah, we we spent forever the past couple of weeks trying to get the new site up and going, and it was quite the experience marking around with that crappy RSS feed, but we had some help from uh, Ken at VGEVO. He helped us out a lot. Really hey, sick. Ken, how's it going? What's up, man? Thank you for saving us a lot of time. and designed Thank us, you for saving me. Designed us some new uh, iTunes graphics and everything, so yep. really cool of them. And speaking of that, you can go to our go to the front page at ontappodcast.com, and we we have new uh, feeds to subscribe to our RSS feed and our iTunes feed. So our old feed, it, our episodes are still listed under there, but we're we're locked out of it for some reason. We can't upload new shows, so make sure to tell everyone, spread the word that we got new feeds, and just to go to our new homepage or just the latest uh, show notes at vgevo.com to get the new feed uh, URLs. So. Glad that's done and out of the way. Yes. And Did, oh, wow, wait, no. Chris, what have you been playing lately? I have been playing... We'll be going over it in the show. It's a Saturn game. Awesome. So... Should I, should I say now? Or? No. Well, yeah, we'll mention it in the show. Yeah, today, like we alluded to last week, uh, we're today we're continuing our summer of console flashbacks, retrospectives, what have you, and uh, we're doing the Sega Saturn today. And mm-hmm. unlike last week, Chris's Sega Saturn actually worked. It works. It stink. Wait, that's the Dreamcast. <laughs> So we're going to be covering a bunch of Saturn games, and just we did some research. We're going to give a give a little history lesson on the system. So be on, be on the lookout for that here in a little bit. Uh, so have you been playing anything non-Saturn? Hmm. Does programming count? Yes. Yes. No. I've been playing PHP, HTML, CSS, and XML. And CSI, the game. No. No. <laughs> no. No. No CSI. For me, what I've been playing, like the last week since we recorded, I pretty much have only been playing uh, just just a couple games. I, I did some other little ones, but nothing really worth mentioning. But uh, still continuing Grand Theft Auto 4. Made a lot of progress in that. Uh, I'm at 58% complete right now. Jesus, man. And about 35 hours. So oh, Sweet. I've been putting a lot of time into that game. and I'm just glad it's almost done. Uh, I was talking to Scott earlier, our other semi-regular co-host, mm-hmm. and I guess he already beat the game, so probably on one of our next episodes here, when we get him on, we'll probably have a more in-depth, belated re- review on the game, much like our Rock Band review. Yeah. So I was um, at work earlier today. We were one of my one of my coworkers picked up uh, GTA 4 for the PS3, and we were just talking about it, and he really loves it too. So I sh- I should get back into that game. Yeah, G- G- Grand Theft Auto 2? Did I say GTA 4? You said 2. Don't! Oh, I meant 4. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, GTA 2, I actually did order that. And, uh, I, did you? I ordered it for a Dreamcast. Uh, I've been I've been digging 4 so much, you know, aside from what I mentioned last episode with there being no mid-mission checkpoints. But uh, other than that, I've been just been digging the story and gameplay so much that I just I want to go back and... Put more time into San Andreas because that that was a GTA game I only put several hours into and wanted to go back to. And I also wanted to experience one of the earlier 2D installments. So, track down, I tracked down GTA 2 for Dreamcast for like 15 bucks and got that. So I'm looking forward to trying that sometime down the line. And uh, but yeah, and then other than uh, GTA 4, I've been pl- I put I did my regular once a month session with Eternal Sonata. <laughs> a few days ago, and yeah, that game, you know, it's it, it's awesome. What can I say? Uh, I did a post about this on the forums recently, about how it's you know, other than probably Earthbound, it's which I think is a unique ex- exception in itself. It's the Japanese RPG I have invested the most time into so far, and that's not saying much because I only got 17 hours into the game so far. <laughs> I usually, More than I have. I I only I'm I'm about halfway through Act Four, 
but I don't know. There's something about that game, the the story, you know, playing in the weird, crazy universe of uh, musical composer Frederick Chopin. I probably pronounced his name wrong. Sorry, dude. Dead dude. But <laughs> he won't care anymore. Yeah. But there's something about that crazy story that that really appeals to me, and this like I like the battles. I don't know. There's something about that battle engine that just does it for me. It's not too overly complex or complicated. Just or so many little interest, intricacies mm-hmm. to learn about the battle system, like some other RPGs. But it's easy to pick up and play. But you know, there's a lot of little things to master. Master like I reached. The first boss in act, the first boss in Act Four when I was playing recently, and it this was like I think it was like the first time I actually died. All my characters died in a battle. Hmm. Like the boss battle was really tough, and usually I just get pissed off when dying. But I, I like it didn't feel like a cheap death. It was more felt like you know I went in with the wrong characters in my party and with the wrong item set. I'm gonna keep mixing it up and figuring it out. You know, adjust my battle plan. And I look forward to each time going to that boss battle, and it took me like an hour and about five or six tries to do, but when I did, I just had this great sense sense of accomplishment, and uh, you know, kind of like how we felt after beating the rock band set list, you know? Oh yeah, the never ending <laughs> set list. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. There's something about that game, and there's rumors going on right now that it's still coming to the PS3 in North America with a bunch of uh, bonus content. Like they just made the announcement in Japan, the Eternal Sonata Japanese edition is coming out with some bonus content. That sounds really good, and it'd be a shame if it doesn't get released in America because it'll miss a, uh, you know, a noteworthy market of gamers. But it, if it does miss out, if you have a 360, you gotta leave. I, I'd recommend checking the demo out for that game. Yeah, I know. I gotta, I gotta start Eternal Sonata again. I have way too many RPGs, and the Saturn retrospective really didn't help much at all. <laughs> right, well, well, let's let's get to that. Um, this is our Sega Saturn retrospective, and. Uh, well, let's just start things off like we did the Sega CD, sh- the Sega CD uh, flashback last episode, and just kind of give a, you know, a, a history lesson on the game, and we'll intersperse it with, uh, I'll, I'll intersperse it with some questions to you, Chris, since, mm-hmm. you know, like the Sega CD, you, you owned one, and I didn't. I, I played it, quite, not a lot, but at least, you know, enough to get a good feel for it, and we just. Just like we did the CDI, we we hooked it up a few days ago, and we went through like your entire s- library of Saturn games. Yep. And we're going to be uh, discussing those too. So just kind of giving quick impressions for your Saturn library, and after revisiting them again after the years. So, uh, Se- Sega Saturn came out in 1994 in Japan, and uh, it was originally announced to come out in America in uh, September of '95, the same month the PlayStation was coming out. You know. PlayStation was Sony's first console. Nine nine ninety five. Yeah, so it was Sony's first console, mm-hmm. but uh, you know, it had the Sony brand, which you know, which means they'll sell millions and millions. Is and millions. is, is nothing to millions scoff at because you know they're big electronics guys, and there's a lot of hype rolling around for the PlayStation. To, PlayStation also, so Saturn kind of did a su- Sega did a surprise move with the Saturn at the very first E3 Expo in 1995 in May 95. Uh, when Sega went to do their uh, presentation, their press conference, they announced that the Saturn, instead of coming out in September, is that it's already out right now, which was a very surprise move yeah. by many people. You know, this this system, which was supposed to come out, uh, you know, four months down the line, all of a sudden finding out it's out now. And uh, what were you did, were you there when you heard that the surprise announcement of the launch, Chris, or did you I, find I, out a few days later? Or I was well, of course I wasn't at E3. I meant like on the news sites or yeah, I knew I knew that it was out. Um, I I didn't get it at the time. I waited out, waited until the PlayStation and got that. Yeah, the PlayStation first. Mm-hmm. Yep. And then I I remember. I didn't know this at the time, but um, Sega heard that, oh my god, the PlayStation could be able to do 3D graphics. We need to slap a quick 3D processor into the Saturn. And that's what they did. They just slapped a cheapo 3D processor into the Saturn and sold it right away. So, And that is why the Saturn doesn't do 3D very well. Later on, I think uh, deve- did, developers cause... started to get used to the, yeah. to the unique uh, hardware of the but Saturn. But at, at the beginning, the the 3D applications were nowhere compare, compared to the PlayStation. 
Yeah, definitely. I know a lot of developers cited at the time that it was just a, a big problem getting games ported over to the Saturn, you know, 3D games. Mm-hmm. Well, at the time, because it was such a rash de- decision, none of the developers knew how to program for the 3D processor inside the Saturn, so they had to wait the full course of what should actually be like a year before the systems actually launched yeah. to learn how to develop for it. Yeah, it was pretty pretty crazy to say the least. And now, on the flip side, the Saturn was probably like one of the, for, at, least, at least for the time one of the best two D systems yes, to program was. for. Yep. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, technical two D show pieces on that system. Like, you know, a lot of the Capcom two D fighting games, like X Men vs Street Fighter. Uh, you know, Marvel ver- oh no, not Marvel vs Capcom, but uh, you know, a lot of those ver- early versus games came out on the Saturn and at least seemed dang near direct ports. Yep. Yeah. And, you know, there's, you know, it seemed like the Saturn did 2D really well, and unfortunately it folk, it seemed to emphasize, like you said, I don't know if they really just slapped a 3D processor on or if it was planned in there from the get-go yeah, or not. It wasn't not. planned, it was, it was just parade, like, hey, yeah. here we go. <laughs> they wanted to do it to keep in competition with the PlayStation. Yeah. But, you know, so like the launch was actually more of a detrimental to the Saturn uh, success in the U.S. that then ended up ended up instead of Sega intending to catch everyone off guard and have a big you know four month uh, you know what was it? what I I can't think of the terms right now a four month uh, window of opportunity of lead over PlayStation sales it ended up they only ended up selling eighty thousand units and the PlayStation by the time that launched. They had over a hundred thousand on their launch alone, so the early launch did nothing for the Saturn. Well, I think um, one of the things that was detrimental to it was wasn't it like four hundred bucks when it came out. Yeah, it was the same price as the PlayStation, but people who wanted no PlayStation to launched for three hundred. Three hundred? Yeah, thought it was four hundred. No, because that was the one of the big things at E3 that year that. That Sony pretty much responded to Sega's press conference because Sega went on first, and their big thing was, "Hey, Saturn, it's out now. Get it, four hundred bucks with Virtua Fighter." Mm-hmm. And then so, so a lot of people were like, "Ah, oh, four hundred bucks," because that kind of set a new uh, price mark for a mainstream system costing that much. I mean, there were other systems at the time released, like you know, the 3DO, like and. And some other systems like Neo Geo, which came out for well above three hundred, like six hundred. Yeah, but like this was like kind of like the first mainstream system by like Sega or Nintendo that came out for like over three hundred, and that that just wasn't received that well. So Sony responded with their press conference by saying the PlayStation was going to launch for three hundred, mm. and that was met with a rousing round of applause. Well, the I believe that they should have held it back until. It was supposed to be launched. Yeah. That that was one of the things that killed them. Yeah. Because, you know, se- I mean, it, besides Sega it, surprising the gaming public, they also surprised retailers and uh, third-party publishers. Mm-hmm. The system wasn't available everywhere. It was only available at select retailers like uh, Software, etc., uh, Kmart, I think, Target. Uh, some noteworthy retailers that were uninformed of the surprise Saturn release was Walmart and KB Toy Store. And as a result, KB Toy Store refused to carry the Saturn, at least for a while. I think Walmart just kind of really downscaled the Saturn presence in retail. Hmm. I don't know, do you remember shopping for Saturn games, that being the case? We used to have a KB Toy Store in town. We used to. Do you, um, remember, do you remember KB and Walmart not having that big of a presence of Saturn games? I don't remember. I never shopped at KB for to- for games, mostly toys. Walmart, I can't remember. I remember Kmart. They had a pretty good presence, but they were god awful expensive. <laughs> and they were morons selling like a three year old game for fifty bucks. Yeah. And then we used to have uh, Labelle's in town. Um, then it got turned into a Best, not Best Buy, but Best, and they used to have Saturn games. Hmm. So, were you saying something earlier about how the launch was, about saying a surprise launch not being so great? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think they they should have held it off, wait the four months. Who cares if it's done? Let the programmers have time to develop for the 3D processor, and then 
actually have some really good launch titles. Yeah. Now, when the Saturn launched, I guess you know it had five. It had five games, and that doesn't seem like a lot. And I nope. guess it still isn't a lot, but compare the N64 launched with two games. <laughs> did it? So I, yeah, it, I guess it did. It did better than that, but I guess still at that time gamers were expecting more. And it came with the Virtua Fighter, and it only had four more games for sale, which were uh, Virtua Fighter, uh, Daytona USA, Clockwork Knight, and Worldwide Soccer. So I don't know. So you said you didn't get your Saturn right at launch, then, nope, Chris? Huh? I didn't. I can't even remember when I got my Saturn. Yeah. So the Saturn, it didn't, it failed to it failed to compete. But uh, it, let, let's let's get talk about some of the technical aspects of the system. It had internal memory like the Sega CD, mm-hmm. and it also had the ability to buy add-on memory. Yep, in a memory cart form. Yeah, it looked like a Genesis cartridge. And there were a lot of rumors that that back slot where you plug the memory card into was going to be for games for for, for backwards compatibility yeah. for Genesis games. But that, but that never took place. Nope. And uh, te- like we said, technically it was very div- difficult to develop 3D games for, but superior for 2D games. And C- Capcom, led, it kind, it really supported the Saturn and the Dreamcast too, with a lot of uh, 2D 2D showcases. And but you know, ultimately, just everything combined, we just the poor. Th- the poor programming and the poor third-party support because of that, it the the Saturn had a quick demise, and within three years or a little over three years, by the end of 1998, the, that there were no more games being released for the system. December 98 saw the last Saturn game released, which was uh, Magic Knight Ray Earth by Working Designs. Poor Working Designs. <laughs> yeah, Working Designs really supported the system too. They saw a number of number of uh you know of its critically acclaimed uh, RPGs released on the system. Mm-hmm. Saturn has some good RPGs yeah. available for it. Well, let's uh, let's get to that. Like let's get to some of the noteworthy games released for the Saturn. Uh it I I got on here some of them here that I remember getting great reviews at the time and just from, you know, reading, you know, various forums and other news sites, just games that are well regarded over over time. I got the Panzer Dragoon trilogy. Yep. <laughs> I'd say two and Saga were probably my favorite games. Yeah, yeah. the first two were like on rail shooters, yep. and like the third one was like kind of like an, an RPG. RPG. Yep. And we'll discuss those a little bit more because you own all three. Mm-hmm. And then also Saturn Bomberman, which which was <laughs> awesome. You can ho- it allowed the ability to hook up two multiplayer adapters and uh, pl- play and on six players. Yep. No, a total of ten players. It wasn't it just six player offline, but ten player online? It also supported online play. No, I can actually. I test this because I actually did ten players. Oh, okay. uh, there was a big, uh, one of the big awesome uh, meetups I had with the awesome community over at TeamFremont.com. We actually got a Saturn on like a, I think it was like a 13-inch TV. <laughs> oh, jeez. Maybe it was a little bigger, 19-inch or something. But and we hooked up two multitasks, and we actually had ten Saturn controllers, mm. and we did ten-player Saturn Bomberman. That would be crazy. And it was amazing. If like when eight people die, the last two people are left over. That'd be crazy, because yeah. the the eight people just ride the rails along the board, and they can shoot bombs and stuff at the living players. It was nuts. Yeah. And there was also a number of uh, shining. Shining Force games released for it, which we'll talk about a little later. You own a couple of those. Mm-hmm. And then there's also the Capcom 2D Fighters we already mentioned. And then Sega was did release pretty faithful arcade ports of their games at the time. Some of them include, you know, the Virtua Fighter 1 and 2. Virtual Cop, wasn't that also Virtual an arcade Cop, yep. port? Sega Rally, Daytona USA, House of the Dead. Sega, you know, they, they were on top of their game doing arcade games at the time, and you know, people love their arcade ports still. And, uh, like we said, too, the working design RPGs. And then finally, I also got on here the Knights, Knights which was kind of like their main answer to kind of like the 3D platformer mascot. Yeah. Uh, they released they released the Knight Stick with, with it, which was kind of the predecessor to the Dreamcast uh, controller. Pretty much identical to the Dreamcast controller, yeah. Just a, just different color scheme, different, slightly different shaped buttons. Yeah. And, and then um, I don't know why people bash the Dreamcast controller. I, I, I really like I it. I love the Dreamcast. For first-person shooters, it was awesome. Do you remember that? Yeah. I mean, it lacked a second analog stick, but other than that, it was great. I think it had one of the few systems, too, that really got an, had an awesome just you know analog uh, mm-hmm. digital pad, too. Yep. 
So. And then um, Game Players Magazine. Yeah. One Christmas they had the uh, Knights Christmas in there, and that was a totally free game, full game. Yeah, say I don't know if it was like I thought. I always thought it was like an expansion or just some bonus missions. Well, you probably bonus missions would be closer to it. You can actually play it standalone on the Saturn, but I can't remember how many missions it had in there. Oh, okay. And then uh, we we mentioned the nightstick. Saturn introduced a lot of uh, accessories to the system. Uh, you know, it had like some of your standard ones, you know, like your light guns and stuff. But it also had a lot of unique ones too. Like it had a flight stick, mm-hmm. and it also had a, 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 the net link, which was kind of like a very early attempt to do online gaming. Yep. I, I yeah, I remember that. I don't remember seeing this out anywhere, and I only think just a few games supported it. I, the only games that come to mind right now are Saturn Bomberman and Duke Nukem 3D. I don't know. Did you ever tr- tr- did you ever try to play Saturn online? Um, I remember my uncle bought the Netlink, and we were setting it up, but I can't remember ever getting it to work. Oh, huh, that sucks. <laughs> so I can only imagine with you know it was dial up and <laughs> 14K technology at the time. You know? Yeah. Oh, look at my Blazing Fast 14.4 modem. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, now, what, what, you, I remember, I, as far as my main memories of the Saturn goes, I, I never owned one, but I remember in about 10, 11 years ago, in 1997, we, there, our town got flooded and we were forced to evacuate for a couple weeks, and we, I spent a week at my uh, cousin's in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis, St. Paul there. And they, he had a Saturn, and at that time, like, the big thing for the Saturn to get it to compete was they they had the Saturn out with three of their top games, like Daytona USA, Virtua Cop, and uh, one uh, one other game, Virtua, Virtua, Fight, Fighter. Virtua Fighter 2. two? Okay. And they had it released for, I think, like, two or three hundred bucks. And he had that, so and we played those we played those three games a lot for like that one week I was down there. We played a lot of those games, and I loved Virtua Fighter too. I thought it was a great port for the time. Mm. I don't know. Did you play a lot of Virtua Fighter? Um, not on the Saturn. No. Uh, I thought I never Dreamcast, PlayStation Two, not Saturn. I I thought like yeah, Virtua Fighter Two had a lot of fun with that. I played that probably the most down there. Uh, Daytona USA, I played played a fair amount of, but. I wasn't a, fu- a f- fan of that style of racing game. It, it kind of seemed like early way of Ridge Racer, where it starts you out off the at the back of the pack of the racing, mm-hmm. the racing squad, and you kind of work your way up throughout the race. I had the Tony USA for the PC also, so I bought it for Saturn. Yep, and then like the last, uh, well, Virtua Cop was a lot of fun. Also, he had two mm-hmm. like. Yeah, two light guns. So we we do two player Virtua Cop. I think we beat that game at least a few times while we were there. Yeah, I remember Virtual Cop, Virtual Cop 2. I played both of those. My uncle had both of them, so. Awesome. They were awesome games. And then he also had his demo disc, and I remember playing World Series Baseball a lot. You can only do Home Run Derby. I must have played that a lot, too. I remember loving World Series Baseball on the Saturn, and I remember hearing that like the later World Series Baseball games on the Saturn were, at that time, some of the best baseball games mm-hmm. that ever. I have um, World Series Baseball 98. I don't know where it is, though. But I have it somewhere. And I was looking forward to playing that when we went through your through your collection uh, last earlier it. this week. But uh, let's let's get to your get to your collection, right. Chris. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, first at the top of the pile here, Virtual I'm, Cop. I'm ask you about Virtual Cop, yeah. And we're just pretty much talking about that. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Virtual Cop. I don't know. I love light gun shooter games. Um. Two player. Uh, <laughs> what do you need to say about it? Yeah, you know, it's, Sega, it's Sega, like a rail light gun shooter. You know, Sega made great light gun games. <clears throat> yep. And this one's easily a must play. <laughs> mm-hmm. Though it'd be proved difficult today with uh, you know HD TVs yeah, being incompatible with the technology used for the old light gun games. Well, I'm not sure if it's necessarily the HD TV. I think we, we I actually. Ha- I we have an LCD TV, which because we we tried hooking up a light gun on the Sega Saturn yeah. and it wouldn't recognize it. No, nope. but I think it, it might be more to the fact that my TV is an LCD and not like a CRT, like light guns are designed to work with. Yeah. So, that's that. Next game on the pile: Three Dirty Dwarves, and <laughs> if everything went well, that was 
a song off that soundtrack was what you heard introducing uh, introducing the show. <laughs> Three Dirty Doors. Yep. You remember? Um, I think we played through this one and we actually beat it. Yeah. Um, can't remember when though. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> we 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 must have been like almost t- ten years ago, yeah, probably I mean, uh, or close to ten years ago because it, that. Three Dirty Dwarves, that game was... That, that was something. It kind of reminded me a lot of uh, Rampage. Oh, yeah. Um, Lizzie, you know, like, Izzy, something, no, pretty Ralph. Much three players, crazy 2D graphics where you're just pretty much destroying the crap out of town. But, like, one thing that happened when we are playing through it that I forgot about, which kind of made it real hard, is your characters, like, kind of fainted after one hit, and you always had to revive them. After with the, the other characters, yeah. with yeah. the other characters, and if you couldn't right away, it was game over. Yep. I kept finding, thinking to myself, where the hell's my life bar? <laughs> nope. But it, nah, it, it, I remember their special move is um, all three of them get in a fight, and you can move around and kill stuff while you're in a fight. You're pretty much invincible when you're in a fight. Um, but yeah, the players would just fight with themselves. It kind of made it's kind of like their power attack. They beat the and like the premise for the story was like really crazy too. Uh, yeah. It's like you're three, was it three or four kids that are taken by the FBI or some government organization because or someone? They, they didn't like them playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I, I don't know. But anyway, these these three characters, these three dirty dwarves, are their characters from Dungeons and Dragons. And once the FBI or whoever it was came to take them away, these three dirty dwarves came alive and came to Earth and decided they're going to rescue these kids. So I and we're playing through it too. We watched the intro cutscene, and that was actually something. It actually, had like a dang near ten minute animated yeah. cartoon introduction to the game, and it was actually pretty good. I mean, for ten years old or however the long or however old the game is. Exactly. All right. Now our next game is R- Road Rash. Road Rash. And this is the game I bought at um, MGC this year. Midwest, the Midwest Gaming Classic. This yep. was one of the games you picked up. And yep. uh, why, don't, why, don't, why don't you tell people of your impressions? Did it compare to the? Did it compare well to the old Genesis games? Well, my favorite still is Road Rash 2 for the Genesis. But this game is, it's a good game still. And good. I thought I, I thought it really up, upgraded and enhanced the 2D. The, like I thought I thought it was pretty much like the Genesis version on steroids, like the 3DO yeah, version. It was. And I thought it really pumped up the you know the sprite models. And when we when we threw it in for a few races, it, it just seemed like the motorcycles were bigger and the racers were bigger and it controlled a little more smoothly. Mm-hmm. And it just seemed because I remember the old Genesis games like for the time they looked good, but going back <laughs> to them now, the, yeah, they look sucky, sucky. Yeah, they look. Horrible, but like the Saturn version, you know, even though it's you know it's kind of 2D sprite, sprite, sprite-based graphics, it, it, I thought they kind of hold up fairly well. Mm-hmm. And I yeah, know, they did. And like you know, yeah, the, the dry, riders look a little more animated, and you had and like some of the the in-game cities you raced in looked great. I thought, and like you didn't see a lot of that in the in the Genesis games. A lot of buildings. No, you didn't. Nope. So I thought I, th- I thought the city levels were pretty awesome. There's a little pop in, of course, but you know. And what I also found you know noteworthy for this version is like the 3DO version, the game had a pretty interesting soundtrack. It had a it had like I think a 14 song soundtrack, and the songs only played during the menus. When you got to in game, you just got this random generic you know. Genesis style background crappy drum beat and I was like why don't you play that awesome menu music in the background of the races it just made no sense to me I, I don't think the Saturn supported custom soundtracks either <laughs> back then <laughs> yeah you know you have the, you have this awesome soundtrack and you won't you won't take you won't make use of it in the game it's like come on <laughs> well it's probably that I had to really access the disc a lot so maybe they couldn't do both the uh, CD audio and the Loading at the same Unacceptable time. Unacceptable answer, Sega. Electronic RC disappointed me. No. Wait, you, you doesn't know. it always disappoint you? Yeah, yeah, that's true. Well, in recent years, anyways, it, it so, does. Some, sometimes they... Sometimes Sometimes they, they release gems, but those are... Army of Two is pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty awesome. You know, EA, they were, I'm surprised they haven't brought back Road Rash. You think they'd bring it back to... Come on, EA, it. you whores. I think do it, do it, do it. 
I think I think there are rumors of them attempting to do a remake for Road Rash, but then I guess rumors say later on that EA eventually just canceled it. And that's kind of disappointing to hear. You figured they'd bring it back by now. You know, you know EA, you know they're big they're big money horse, so I heard a rumor that EA is going to release Madden 09. Think that's true? Oh yeah. Yep. Yep, I I do believe there will be a Madden 3009. <laughs> there will be. <laughs> so long as there's an EA, there will be Madden. Okay, the next game I got down on the next game I got down on here is Shining the Holy Ark, and I guess you never got a chance to throw this in before. Nope, I didn't. Um, this was that first person RPG, right? Yeah, kind yeah, of. Yeah. Okay. Yep. You know, based in the um, Shining Force universe. Yep. This was the one that. We had to let play just because it was so screwed up. Remember? Yeah, the game had a crazy story. Yeah, it was like you're going into a mine to defeat somebody, but in the middle of this, aliens come down. (laughs) I'm like, what the heck? We're both like, what the hell's going on here? Yeah, it starts off like your kind of like your typical medieval fantasy style RPG game, exploring this cave and. It just, it just all of a sudden, yeah, like you said, aliens. Aliens come down and like there, there's a battle going on between a good race of aliens and a bad race of aliens, and you're thrown into this because the aliens invade your bodies and yeah, like it's just weird. Like, like the bad aliens end up kicking your guys' ass, and they, I guess. And then the good aliens come and save you and say, "Oh, we're sorry, we'll." Invade your bodies and heal you. We'll we'll take over your bodies and cause your we'll, we'll, we'll heal your bodies over time. And what was that one great quote? Um, uh, yeah, I got <laughs> I, I wrote it down here. Um, r- rod sustained uh, d- sustained brain damage from falling rocks. <laughs> <laughs> We're like, holy crap! That's the best quote ever. Yeah. I don't know, maybe it was some of that in- j- that uh, Japanese translated English or something. I don't know. But yeah, for like for for battles, it was it was kind of like a wizardry. Yeah, you know, your old school first person style, but then or like um, uh, Dragon Warrior. Yeah, w- which was which they said uh, kind of used wizardry as inspiration yep. for their battle engine. So, but like it kind of, you actually saw your characters whenever they'd cast an attack, they'd kind of jump on screen and you'd see them attack the monster and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it kind of had its own little innovations there. But yeah, that story, I wish we could have put more time into it, but. Well, I will, but first I want to get to another RPG that we'll announce later in the show. Alright, well, let's let's just get to that one right now. Another shining game is Shining Force 3. Oh, no, that's not the game I'm talking about. Oh, well, it, well, since we're on Shining Force okay. 3, let's talk about it. <laughs> this uh, basically, it's, uh, if you ever play Final Fantasy Tactics or Tactics Advanced or Vandal Hearts or uh, any, like, Ogre Tactics or anything like that, it's basically the same where you have, like, a, a checkerboard type system and you move your It's just like an I- isometric uh, grid. Yeah, yep. And... Dale knows I love those games, so I'm going to be putting more time into this game as well. Yeah, I'm surprised by your timer on the progress bar that you, you only said your guys were, you only were like two hours into it or something. Yeah, yeah. And then I we threw it in. I watched you go through this battle, which took you know your traditional tactic style battle, which <laughs> took like a half hour or so to complete. I'm like, and then you just turn it off, and I'm like, dude, aren't you going to save? <laughs> You're like, no. <laughs> no, I'll just go back to it later. But yeah, that that looked pretty Besides, good. Something's wrong with the. Uh, I think the battery's dead inside the Saturn, so I got to replace that. So. Uh oh. But yeah, Shining Force looked pretty good. And mm-hmm. so. All right, but before we get to your, well, I think we'll save that other RPG yeah, for last year. Yeah, I think we should here. save it. A nice way to close out. Being it's kind of a flagship game. But uh, next game here is one I know you're a big fan of that cost you two dollars is uh, Shanghai Triple Threat. <laughs> it's it's a mahjong game and I like mahjong. What can I say? You know, yeah, it's just a simple mahjong. I mean, before this I didn't even know what mahjong was. I knew it was popular in Japan, mm-hmm. but and I thought it was some complicated card game or something. No, it's basically kind of like the card game we have here in America where you match up two cards. The and memory game. That's games. it. Yeah, memory game. That's yeah. pretty much it. That's the whole game. Yours Goodbye. M- yours matching tiles. Yep. <laughs> it looked like it'd be like a quick, easy 
just kind of pick up and play fun. But there's a little bit of strategy involved in it. But you got your two dollars worth, huh? Yep, I got my two dollars worth. All right, flipping the page. Daytona USA is what I got on here now. Rolling Stone. That's a, that was that's a theme song or something? No, it just says rolling. It sings rolling start because your your car's actually going before the start timer starts. So right on. Oh uh, yeah. So Daytona USA. I remember playing this in the arcades. I kind of mentioned it too. Um, what, what were your thoughts on Daytona USA? I know you liked Ridge Racer. That's what, that's what Daytona USA reminded me of. Did you think it held up pretty well? Um, Daytona USA is is not a full fledged game. I think there's. Well, it's an arcade game. Yeah. I think there's only like three tracks on there that you can play. Yeah. Uh, I can't even remember. Well, Daytona, obviously. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's pretty much a very basic racing game. And I kind of had a, It was kind of like some weird, quirky fun playing through it and kind of just wrecking and just... I, I thought it had pretty good graphics for the time, considering it was 1995 and for yep. the Saturn, the yeah. kind of graphics it had. I thought it was pretty good. Yep. Okay, now we're going to get to the uh, awesomeness that I know you've been waiting for, Chris. We'll start with the first one, the Panzer Dragoon Trilogy. Now, the first, let's, let's just cover the first two Panzer Dragoon games. Both of them were uh, on-rail shooters. Yep, both of them are pretty much the same. Uh, Panzer Dragoon 2 had, of course, better graphics. Um, but Panzer Dragoon 1, it was an on-rail shooter. It was just your basic shooter. Um, you fly a dragon... That's pretty much it. It's you're you're going against the evil galactic empire who, uh, of course, wants everybody dead or to worship them or something. Now, did but did you find the on rail shooter gameplay was that was that pretty good for the time? Was yeah. it a lot of fun? I remember I liked two a lot better though. And Panzer Dragoon One was also um, released as a bonus in uh, Panzer Dragoon Orta for the Xbox. Once you beat the game, you can play Panzer Dragoon One. Oh, that's a cool bonus. So, yep. No, and I remember, I, I remember playing the first game just once briefly before, but like, didn't, didn't these games have a, uh, like, pretty, pretty epic storylines? Yeah, yeah, they did. Like they actually had. I can't remember anything about them, but they, yeah, they did. They actually had pretty in-depth cutscenes and everything. Yep. Um, Panzer Dragoon Saga or Panzer Dragoon Trilogy was, um, it was kind of a flagship series for the for Sega, so. They dumped a lot of money into them, and as a result, they're actually pretty damn good. Nice. Now, let's let, no, pretty much the first two Panzer Dragoon games, would you recommend them if people happen to run across them? If people happen to run across them, I would recommend Panzer Dragoon 2, Zwei or Zwei or whatever, um, more than I would recommend 1. But if you have Saga, or if you're going to pick up Saga, I would recommend picking up all three just so you can fill out your trilogy. Now, uh, all right, now let's let's go to uh, the the main one, Panzer Dragoon Saga. That was like was released the last year the Saturn came out, and because of that, it had a really low print run of just 10,000 copies. Mm -hmm. You know, very hard, incredibly rare to find. How, how did you run across this gem of a title? Um, actually, my uncle gave it to me. He just gave it to you. He just gave it to me. Wow. For my birthday or Christmas or something like that. <laughs> so, which was a really nice gift. This is, I am. He had a Saturn also, and I constantly played this game over at his place. So he just gave it to me. Um, it was a four-disc Saturn game. We briefly put it in. I wouldn't um, say briefly. We we threw it in, started the opening cutscene, and like. Yep. We played for like we threw it in for like about an hour, and of that hour, I think we only played for about probably ten, fifteen minutes. Yeah, there was a lot of cutscenes, which is kind of surprising for the time too. Mm -hmm. Well, the the main intro cutscene was pretty long. Yeah, kind of, and, and it actually still looks good today. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's no Xena Saga or anything like that cutscenes or. Final Fantasy or anything like that, but it's still... Well, for Saturn, it looks fairly yeah, decent. Yeah, for Saturn, yeah, it was good. Yeah. yeah. So no. it's, it's all about, again, your... But it pretty much introduces you to this character, like he's working in this minefield or something. Yeah. No, not a mine, I just say... <laughs> mine some shaft Some kind of or... excavation site. Yeah, there you go. And, like, it gets invaded by monsters, 
and you well, the excavation site is they're looking for there's an ancient civilization that they're trying to mine and find secret weapons for the emperor or empire and um, occasionally while they're excavating they'll run into like We're ancient monsters that will just well that kind of want to rip their heads off <laughs> and there's a faction of the empire that I don't know what they want to do. They just don't like the empire, which <laughs> you know, I think they're a bunch of assholes. So they're I agree doing with the business for themselves. Yes, they're they're rogue. But anyways, they come to this mine shaft and they hear that they're about to. Hey, we're about to find a secret weapon. So they steal the secret weapon, and hell breaks loose. And you find a dragon, and you go after the empire, and you have fun. <laughs> So, <laughs> over the course of four discs. Yes. No, I, I, re I really like that opening cutscene, too. That yeah. was very well produced. Yeah, it, it was. just fantastic. Mm-hmm. And you still have your Panzer Dragoon 1 and 2 uh, on-rails gameplay, too. Yep, you do. But um, then they but also kind of have a more deeper fighting system, also. Yep. Um... This is like Panzer Dragoon 1 and 2 in that when you're flying... You know, you can. There's worms that pop up, or there's items like treasure chests over in the distance, and you can, you can shoot at them, and their contents will come to you. But then, all of a sudden, random battle appears, and um, you can, you try to maneuver your dragon so that he won't take any damage. Meanwhile, you try to hit the weakest point in your enemy, and the battles are actually pretty fun. Yeah, watch you play a couple. That, and they, yeah. they looked, you know, for the time, you know, pretty. Yeah, they were they were really like innovative battles too, because nobody's ever done this before. Yeah, so definitely. I would re definitely recommend if you could find this game for, for probably under hundred bucks. For <laughs> under two hundred bucks, get it. Even two hundred bucks if you have the money, get it. You know, unless you don't have a Saturn, then it can be a waste of money. No, you should still get it. Yeah. Okay. You can find a Saturn for way cheaper than you can find this game for. I see Saturns at uh, local shops here for I think I saw one for forty bucks. Yeah, so you can find like five. You can buy five Saturns for the price this game will cost you. Overall, though, Chris, uh, considering the Saturn and its its game library and for what it has, would you, would you recommend it? Um, Saturn, I wouldn't. I would recommend it to people knowing that Saturn isn't going to live up to the PlayStation 3 or the 360 or even the Wii. Um, I would recommend to people that are into retro gaming and that Well, yeah, I'm, obvi money, I'm ob obviously not asking to say, hey, today I want another game yeah. system that's right up there with like the current stuff that's on 360 and PS3. No, but as far as like hunting down retro if, systems... If you have the money, then yes, do it. <laughs> the Saturn is worth it, and if you can find good games for it, then do it. I guess if you're really into the import scene, that's that's yeah, where I hear a lot of the, the the better games are that never made it stateside. So. Mm -hmm. And before. Like that weird one they were playing MGC. What the heck was that? Oh. You're like sure. a naked guy shooting stuff. Like I, I forget. boobs or something. <laughs> I forget the name of it, but it was like some crazy 2D shoot 'em up yeah, where. Yeah. It was just what the yeah. heck is going on here? I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, the guys are like, I don't know what's going on, but this game is freaking awesome. It was the craziest <laughs> game yeah. I've ever played, I'll say that. And they paid like 30 bucks for it. <laughs> so be like, before, before we wrap, I know I don't own a Saturn. I don't think I'll get one, but uh, that's just me. Um, I, I got too many other classic gaming systems. So mm -hmm. <laughs> before, we, before we wrap things up here, uh, we got a... Uh, we we like we did for the last episode. Where I sent a shout out for emails and on on the forums, if for the community to send us some lines or if they got any thoughts or memories of the Saturn they want to share. And we did we did get one response here, and this is from a VGEVO forum member uh, Talizo or Talzo, and this is what he has to say. Well, I live in Europe, so I can only speak of my experience with the console in PAL land. First off, before the 32-bit era, I owned a Sega Mega Drive, which is the Genesis, with my brother. We were very pleased with the console, but fewer games were released 
for it as time passed. Both the Sony PlayStation and Sega Saturn had already been released. Now was the hard part. Should we buy a Saturn or a PlayStation? My family is divided into two parts. I have a French mother and a Norwegian father. At the time we were in France, Saturn seemed to have decent hype in the country, contrary to the almost non-existent presence in Norway. Since I lived in Norway, most of my friends had a PlayStation, thus I wanted a PlayStation so I could borrow some games. My brother, however, had read a lot about the Saturn in French gaming magazines, and he wanted a Saturn. I remember him saying something like, But it's Sega. (laughs) That's what I said. How can Sega screw up? I didn't care, and I insisted that we should get a PlayStation instead. It was cheaper, and my friends had one. Also, I had seen Crash Bandicoot and a few other interesting games, so we bought a PlayStation and paid half of the price, e- and each of us paid half the price. I'm not sure how much time passed, but eventually my brother had a buyer's remorse. He, quote, sold, he, he sold me part of his ownership of our PlayStation. He then bought a Sega Saturn used with a lot of games with it. Games like Virtua Fighter, Virtua Fighter 2, Virtua Fighter Kids, Knights with the Analog Pad, Guardian Heroes, Panzer Dragoon 1 and 2, Sonic Jam, Sonic R, Story of Thor 2, Sega Rally, Bug, and some sports games. Needless to say, that library destroyed the puny PlayStation games I owned. I was hopelessly addicted to Guardian Heroes, replaying the game day after day, same thing about Knights. Virtua Fighter was also the first 3D game I played, and I thought Virtua Fighter Kids was fun. Panzer Dragoon amazed me, even if I sucked at it. Sega Rally got even my father interested in playing video games. I remember him being impressed. That was another game that both amazed me and made me realize that I sucked at it. Ditto about Panzer Dragoon. The story of Thor 2 introduced me to a mix between a Zelda game and an RPG game like never before. But guess what? My brother was eventually tired of the Saturn and sold his entire collection. I still regret letting him do that, although I got a Saturn back a few years ago with some of the games we once had. Guardian Heroes was an awesome multiplayer experience that I still love. Virtua Fighter, Sega Rally, and Panzer Dragoon were mind-blowing for their time, and Knights had a unique single-player experience that I did not feel the Wii sequel had at all. I know I should have bought a Saturn instead. I had a blast with the game my brothers had and some of the games proved hard to get later on. Thanks, Tailzo, for your for your thread. That was that uh, was quite the read. It took a little while, but no, it was the only one we got, so we, we had time. You know, I think I have Guardian Heroes. Yeah. So that, that brings my count up to three games I can't find. <laughs> uh, uh, World Series Baseball, Dragon Force, or something like that. He doesn't really say, Guardian Heroes. He doesn't really say what Guardian Heroes is about. Is that like a fighting game? Um, I can't remember, but I remember the title of it. <laughs> Great uh, memory of games. Yes. It was ten years ago. <laughs> Come on. Even I remember my... No, I'm just joking. Just joking. I remember Mario 1. <laughs> All right. Actually, I do remember well, Mario 1. Th- well, thanks, thanks for the email, uh, Tailzo. And uh, we guys want your emails again and, uh, and, and forum posts, too, about... Uh, uh, the next re- the next retrospective we're going to do, though, I think I'm going to be reaching far out there for people who may or may not have owned this uh, unique platform. Uh, like I, uh, uh, bah, I can't talk today. Our next sh- our next show, we're doing a retrospective on the 3DO. 3DO. The Trip Hawkins disaster piece. <laughs> no. <laughs> who? Doesn't matter. No, that was the that guy was kind of the brainchild behind the 3DO, which we'll be talking about all all of next episode on. So if you happen to have played a 3DO, owned one, played some of its games, shoot us a line, or po- I'll create a thread here soon on the on our forums at vgevo.com, asking people for their 3DO memories, and you can either post a line or two there, or send us an email at our new email address. We got a new email address. Mm-hmm. So, or new website, new email address. So, shoot those emails to mailbag at ontappodcast dot com. Two P's. Yeah, two P's. <laughs> Once again, mailbag at ontappodcast dot com, and we'll make sure to read them on the air. So, that wraps it up for this episode. Chris, thanks for making it on. Mm-hmm. Well, it is my apartment, and I have nothing to do anyway. So, yeah. 
<laughs> so yeah, check out our forums uh, we that I already mentioned vgevo.com great community check it out. We will always interested on hearing feedback on each and every episode. And uh my email address once again mailbag at ontappodcast.com. That's also the same domain as our new website. Really if you haven't listened to some of our older episodes and want to dig through our archives, check it out ontappodcast.com. What is the website again? I forgot. Ontappodcast.com. Okay. One more time? Uh, no. <laughs> Okay, guys, everyone, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you all next time. All right, later.